It is awesome to be here at the Allen County Right to Life, and I am privileged to be the keynote speaker this evening, although there are so many more of you who would be much better at this. I always just say I'm nothing but the Lord's donkey. My job is to get him where he has to go and then get out of the way. Oftentimes, I'm a stubborn donkey. A few minutes ago, when we were doing that auction, I felt like a donkey being sold at the auction. <laughs> Last year, I felt pretty good because I sold for 1700 Then Bishop Darcy sold for 10000 I felt so devalued. <laughs> this year, I feel I got back my dignity. <laughs> it is a joy to be here with you because the cause for the right to life is dear to my heart. When I was just a, a young college student, I had my conversion back to the faith when I was a senior in high school, and then I went to college for a year before joining the Friars, and I really didn't give much thought to the whole pro-life movement. And this woman by the name of Kate Michaelman came into my class to give us a talk on the wonders and greatness of Planned Parenthood. And as I'm sitting there listening to her, I looked up as she's going on about how easy abortion is now to get it. This is 1986 or 85. And I looked up at her and I said, it's a baby. She said, no, it's a glob of cells. And all of a sudden, this light went up. I said, no, it's a human person. It's a baby. And she goes, you must be Catholic. Now, at the time, I wasn't fully converted. I said, you bet your sweet beep, I am. I edited that for the mixed audience. <laughs> we began to yell at each other. I stormed out of the room, and I said, what just happened? This light went off in my mind and in my heart that I realized and understood that the child in the womb is a person who is sacred unto the Lord, made in the image and likeness of God, and I had to step up and step in the battle and in the fight. Let me begin by reading from John's Gospel. I'm getting old, I need glasses. If you've seen my sandals, let me know. At the end of John's Gospel, chapter 17, it's the end of the Last Supper discourse. This is the longest prayer we have of Jesus. And it's the second part of the prayer I want to read to you. And he begins to pray for those who will believe in him through the word of the apostles. He began by praying for the apostles. Then he prays for those who will believe in him through the apostles. That would be us. Here is Christ's prayer for us. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me through their word, so that they will be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them, you in me, that the world may know that you sent me, and that you loved them even as you loved me. Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am they also may be with me, that they may see my glory and the glory you gave me before the world began, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and they know that you sent me. I made known that to them your name, and I will make it known that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. This is one of the most beautiful prayers we have from Christ because we get to peek or listen in on the conversation between God the Father and God the Son. And the request of God the Son to God the Father is that we be one. One in Him, and by being one in Him, to be one with Christ. That we are to be brought together as one, so that the world may believe that the Son was sent by the Father, and believe in the truth of the revelation of the love of God the Father. That God the Father loves us, to quote our Lord, even as they love me. To believe that reality, not truth, that the human person is sacred 
from the moment of conception to natural death, that each and every person is loved by God with the same love that God the Father has for God the Son. He has for every human person, born and unborn. And so each person receives their dignity, not from a piece of legislation, nor of some decree by Congress, but they to receive their dignity from a God who says, I love them. They are made of my image and likeness. They are sacred. They are beautiful. They are good. And they are worth dying for. This is what our Lord told us from that cross. That we are worth His death. That cross is our price tag. That's what the human person means to God. I had received in the mail a few weeks ago a package from Our Sunday Visitor. If you don't get Our Sunday Visitor, you should get it. Uh, there was a series of magazines they sent in this one package, and it was cover stories of their magazines for the past 100 years. So there was one cover page from each of the years of the past 100 years as they celebrated their centenary this year. And so I started paging through one of them this morning, and I ran across this article from 1927. And there's a picture here of a man praying. It says, Victims of Injustice in Mexico. And this is what it reads, if I can read it with this tiny, tiny print to make it worse. Last week, we showed in pictures the sh shouting of General Gomez, one of the four men who had announced their candidacy for the office of president against Obregón, the candidate of Calles. A week or so later, there was one of those small rebellions against the injustices of Mexico, ruling powers, and of course, the clergy of Mexico, of whom there are very few left. Most have been killed. The American papers had just begun to pre present Calis in his true light as a protector of Bolshevism, as an agitator of anti-American feelings in Nicaragua, and as a tyrant eclipsing Nero in slaying his own citizens. The government must justify itself against the last mentioned charge, and their excuse is that rebellious mu rebellions must be quelled, that the people must be intimidated into submission. But why the rebellions? Well, the war on the church must be justified, and therefore the clergy and the bishops must be held responsible for the little revolution which broke out somewhere nearly every week in the Republic. Of course, the world has only the government's words for anything that goes on in Mexico. No one may speak to the outside world except Calles and his sympathizers. The church is accused, but it may not disprove the accusation. The order of the execution of the priest, his brother, and the two others was not made known to them until a couple of hours before. Then it goes on to another page. The caption under the priest who is praying reads, the picture above shows Father Miguel Augustin Pro, the Mexican priest who was executed in a, few, a few weeks ago without any trial. On his knees, he prays for his executioners. At the funeral, 30,000 30, people mourning him and showed their disapproval of the action of the Calles government. Flowers were showered on his coffin and throngs acclaimed him a martyr. That's a photograph a week after the martyrdom of who we now know as Blessed Miguel Pro, the first photographed martyrdom in history. In the government of Mexico, in the 1920s, the government turned against the church. It turned against faith. It turned against truth. It turned against God and began to persecute the faith, driving many of its citizens and many of its people out of the country and putting many of them to death. If you have not seen the movie For Greater Glory, get the movie. It is absolutely stunning to watch what really took place. And the men and women who sacrificed their lives, sacrificed their families, sacrificed everything to defend religious freedom. They were known as the Cristeros, those who would stand up for Christ. They would cry out, Viva Cristo Rey, to each other as they went forth to do the working of justice, to try to reclaim the country for their own. One little boy, Jose Luis Sanchez, 13 years old, 
was one of the Christeros. He was a holy young man, faithful to the Lord. The soles of his feet were cut off after he was captured. He was made to walk miles to his grave. And there his own godfather tried to get him to betray his own faith. His parents were made to stand there as their boy was standing before his executioners. And they told him to deny his faith. He looked at his mother. He said, I love you. Then he smiled and said, Viva Cristo Rey. He was stabbed. He fell to the ground. He drew a cross in the dirt and said, I'm going home as he was shot and rolled into his grave. His mother, like a woman from the book of Maccabees, smiled with great joy and that her son received the greatest honor in giving his life for Christ. These people suffered much, gave much, because of what they believed for the truth, for God, for faith, defended their homeland. I used to watch movies like this and be so amazed at these people, and I used to wish I could live among those people and know them. And this past Saturday, while I was attending the Freedom Rally, Pat Miller was talking about his father and grandfather and the fidelity to this country and so forth and how they came here for freedom. And as I'm standing there, I began to realize something about my own family. I have half Italian blood and my other half of me is Cuban, quite mixed. My grandfather was an American citizen growing up in Cuba. He was very involved with many things down there. My great-grandfather had built a Carmelite convent for nuns, and my grandfather and his brothers did a lot of the work within that convent, which would eventually house Mexican nuns, Carmelite nuns, who were fleeing from the tyranny of Calles in Mexico. He gave, they were given shelter there in that, that monastery in Cuba. It wasn't too many years after that in Cuba, my family began to see its own rights being taken away from it slowly. Stripped of its rights, stripped of their religious freedom and religious liberty. One of my uncles was tortured in ice water for an entire week by Fidel and friends. Throughout the night in the prison, sounds of gunshots would be heard. But prior to the gunshot was always the cry, Viva Cristo Rey! Live Christ the King! My aunts, my uncles, in the middle of the night, with Father Peco, would go to the Catholic churches, take the gold, the silver, the statues, everything they could pick up and carry, bring it back to our home and bury it under the house so that it would not be defiled or desecrated, risking their lives. Eventually, they would have to risk their own lives to help Father Peco and other priests escape from Cuba to come here for freedom. My own family would survive and make it, some of them stowaways on boats, risking their own lives to come. It was last Saturday I realized I did live among heroes. My grandfather, my uncles, my aunts, my great-grandfather, men and women who lived in a country where they were free until that freedom was taken away from them and had to flee that country to another land where they could be free. And here we are, 40 years later, and the fight has fallen to me and to us in this land that they came to for freedom, in this land they came to, to be able to exercise their faith freely, and now it's being threatened. In less than 30 days, a major decision will be made in our country. Whether or not we will remain free, or the grip around our neck will become tighter. As we are threatened over again, when those threats will become realities. In less than 30 days, America will decide whether or not our land will remain the land of the free 
or the First Amendment will be exed out of the constitutions. These are serious times. This is nothing, not, nothing to play with. This is not just a matter of another political party, another this or another that. These are serious times. It wasn't long ago when I opened up the newspapers and I saw Bishop Laurie standing before or sitting before the subcommittee on the Constitution trying to defend the church's rights. This is insane happening here in our own country under the stars and stripes. The red stripes in that flag stand for the blood that was shed. Shed for freedom. And now it's fallen to us, to our generation, to choose whether or not we're going to hold that flag up and honor the red in that flag that stands for the blood that was shed for our freedom, or whether we will allow that flag to fall to the ground. These are serious times. This is not like any other election we have faced before. I know we're here for the pro-life cause. I know we're here because we want to defend the unborn. We're here because we want to make sure that every single unborn child has dignity, is reverenced, and is given the right to life. Absolutely. But now the fight is much bigger I thank God for the work that has happened in here in the state of Indiana that abortions have dropped 56%. God bless you who have worked so hard for this. This is awesome. But all this will be lost if the wrong administration is put in and it becomes just part of everyday society here in the United States of America. And the church is no longer tolerated no longer accepted. And we have to, as one bishop said, check people's baptismal certificates before we give them a bowl of soup at a soup kitchen. This is insane. And we need to move and move quickly and strongly. And we can that. Let's not forget that these regimes, these governments that we look at in the past, who turn to hatred towards the church, who turned towards hatred towards persons, did not simply take office. Some of them were voted in by their people and supported by their people. I'm not trying to make the comparison between Adolf Hitler and Barack Obama. Please don't misunderstand me when I say this. But Adolf Hitler was voted into office by his people. Everyone knew who he was. He wrote Mein Kampf. All they needed to do was to go to a bookstore and pick it up and read it. It wasn't his first attempt at office either. And it wasn't Adolf Hitler who killed six million Jews, two million Catholics, a couple of hundred thousand gypsies. He convinced the nation to do it. How many men does it take to run enough death camps to kill eight million people? The people running those death camps were fathers of families, young men, young adults. It was a nation that was convinced to do it. What needed to happen was the conversion of a nation, a conversion of a people, in order to turn around and realize the evil of what was happening in their land. The work that we have to do in our day and age is more than just the politics, although the politics are vitally important. It's more than just shutting down the abortion clinics, although shutting down the abortion clinics is vitally important. It's more than just getting things uh, uh, happening here, there, groups organized. Those are incredibly important, but it's more than that. Ultimately, what needs to happen is the new evangelization. We need to take the saving truth of the gospel into our hands and bring it into the very fabric of society. Amen. Blessed John Paul the Great called for the new evangelization. The new evangelization is not the evangelization of people who have never heard the gospel. The new evangelization is the re-evangelization of the people who have forgotten the faith. 
who know Jesus but do not know Jesus, who know of the church but do not know the church, who know about faith but do not know the faith. I'm not talking about the intellectual faith, but the knowledge and love and faith of God down here in the depth of the heart. We need to bring the saving mission, the gospel, to every corner of our society. This battle will be won when the nation is converted back to faith. That's why it's important for us, people of faith, to not to be afraid to speak the truth. Not to be afraid to share the truth of our faith with others. It's not going to be a matter of simply the politics. It must be reaching into the heart of every man, woman, and child and bringing God to that heart and that heart to God. Conversion to truth. Conversion to faith. Conversion to goodness. Conversion to God himself who is true and good. And is love. This culture, this society of ours, voted in this administration, a culture that ignored the issues of life, ignored many things, or it just didn't matter to them. Even people of our own faith could not recognize what was happening in front of them and see the reality of what was about to take place if that man had got into office with his administration. Even people of Christian denominations couldn't see it. But we see it now. We need to take off the blinders by coming to the light who is Christ. We need to pray for the intercession of the great St. Augustine that he will assist us in bringing light to this world. So just as Christ shouted and broke through his deafness, just as Christ shined upon him and shattered his blindness, so may the good Lord shatter the blindness of our land. May the good Lord shout and break through our deafness. May the good Lord draw us to himself by truth, by love, and through us. And through us. We are the ones who are responsible in our day and age. We are the ones who right now know the truth of Christ Jesus. We are the ones right now who love him deeply with our hearts. We are the ones right now who know how much we are loved by God. We are the ones who know the dignity of each and every single human person. Woe to us if we do not speak. Woe to us. Woe to us if we do not defend life. That was a quote from blessed John Paul the Great from his meeting with teenagers in Denver. Woe to you if you are not successful in defending life. Woe to you. So we must be strong. We must realize and see the signs of our times. And we must rise to the occasion, and do what is ours to do. Generations from now will look back on our generation and make a judgment upon us. They will either say they were a lazy generation. When push came to shove, they laid down. Or they will say of us, they are a, fort, a, a strong generation with fortitude. That when push came to shove, they shoved back. Shoved back with love, with kindness, with charity, with goodness. Shoved back with the truth. Embraced them with the truth. And brought this culture back to the fullness of divine life in God. Why is it us that has to face these days? Who of us ever believed we would have to face the moment when we would have to decide whether or not our country will remain free to practice its faith? It doesn't matter why it's us. The fact is, it's us. I always say, God, why me? And he looks and says, because I couldn't find anybody more pitiful to show through my power.
Now is the day. Why these times? We don't know why. All we know is it is. And this is the challenge of our day and age. It's our time. And we must come together as one. This is the prayer of Christ. Father, may they be one. It is now time for us to be one, to give a clear witness of unity. What is the goal of love but union? The goal of love is union. If we truly love one another, we shall be one. And from that unity, we shall proclaim to the world the dignity of the human person, made in the beautiful image and likeness of God, sacred, beloved of God, cherished by God, with a price tag that God himself put upon the human person, his own sacred blood. We must be one. We must come together as one, as a city. A Catholic brethren with our Orthodox brethren, a Lutheran brethren, Methodists, our evangelical brothers and sisters, all of us coming together to truly work together. If our only common ground we can find at this point is the name of Jesus Christ, well then let it be the name of Jesus Christ. That's a great starting point, isn't it? <laughs> I believe this began to happen not too long ago when Bishop Rhodes was beginning a great fight on behalf of the bishops or with the bishops for religious freedom. And the various Lutheran ministers came to the steps of the cathedral and showed their support for him in a public manner. I know the bishop was deeply moved in the depths of his heart at that moment. When I read about it, I wept myself over the beauty that what took place at that moment, that there was a coming together to be one, to fight this fight shoulder to shoulder, side by side, a unified force. We don't want the politicians and the people of our society to look in our faces and see a divided church, a divided people, a divided faith. You know the devil's motto, divide and conquer. Christ's motto is, unite and fight and conquer. Unite in Him. <laughs> this coming into unity with one another, this forming a union together, will take some work on our part, but Kathy is always up for the charge. <laughs> to pull together, to work hard, Look at what we've done in just a few short years. 56% less abortions here in this county. It's astounding. Astounding. What if we really worked together? What if we really stayed together as a unified force? What if we went out to those people that we know involved in the fight who aren't here tonight and brought them into that unity? participating in all the events that are out there, the 40 Days for Life and the Friends for Life camp and all these various different things. What if, what if, what would happen if we fulfilled that what if? We'd see that 56% drop quite a bit. But more importantly, we must stand together for the entirety of our culture, for the protection of our religious liberty so that we may be able to even continue this fight. That we can even gather together in this banquet hall and proclaim the name of Christ together. To gather in His name. To gather for this fight. Who knows what would happen if all of a sudden they took away our freedom of speech because we're speaking about faith. We don't know what the future would be in, what is in store for us. If we don't protect our religious freedom, what else will they take away? My brothers and sisters, Christ prayed that we may be one. May we be drawn together as one and truly stand together and do what is ours to do 
to do what is ours to do. I'd like to end with his one last story. True story of a kid I knew in the South Bronx. He was uh, quite the kid. He was, they used to call him an, Crazy Angel. Angel was a wonderful youth ministry. He had a very, very large um, youth group, and he was very, very active in the faith. And, but you meet him, and the guy's got like scars on his face and all this other stuff. So one day I pulled him aside. I said, Angel, what's your story? He says, well, when I was growing up, my parents died very young. I was left alone in this world. I grew up on the streets. I learned various martial art techniques just to stay alive. He said, at one point, I was engaged to this girl. I loved her very much. And she was shot and killed by a drive-by. He said, I went to a depression. I was put into the hospital for a long time. And I, was, I wouldn't eat. I wouldn't sleep. I'd drink. I wouldn't talk to anybody. I would just lie there. I'd stare at the wall. He said, one day this woman came into my room. She knelt down next to me on my bed and she said, Angel, what's wrong? Don't you know God loves you? God's given you many gifts and talents. You must use your gifts and talents for the glory of God. She leaned forward. She kissed him on the forehead and left the room. Angel said, all of a sudden he got this thirst to be alive, a thirst to live. And, and he, all of his faith that he was taught when he was very, very little came back to him. And he, and he came out to find out who came to visit him. And the nurses looked at him confused and said, Angel, you haven't had a visitor since you've been here. He says, no, someone was just in my room. They said, Angel. He goes, forget it, whatever. Maybe I'm just crazy. Anyway, he called this local parish priest that he knew about, and he knew that this priest would take in kids who were really in hard times. And he was 18 at this time. And so he calls him up. He says, Father Joe, can you take me in? I need a place to go. He says, well, Angel, you're a cook, aren't you? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, you can cook for me. So he takes him in. He's the cook for the, for the uh, parish priest and... So one day there's a banging at the door, and a kid's banging at the door, he's screaming, he says, get Father Joe, get Father Joe, get Father Joe, and the angel's like, he's not here, he says, get Father Joe, he says, he's not here, what's the matter, they killed my brother, they killed my brother, he goes running out in the street, and there's a kid, a nine-year-old kid lying dead in the street, two gangs were fighting, and this kid got caught in the middle, angel picked the kid up off the ground, held him close to his chest, and began to scream, stop it, stop it, you're killing each other, stop it, just stop it. All the gangs were just kind of standing around as they would do. Cops came over, said, oh, another dead one. Put the kid in a body bag, took him away. Angel wandered into the church, and he sat there praying. A gang member came in behind him and said, Angel, nice words. He says, thanks, man. He goes, nah, just words. Now, Angel's a pretty tough kid. He turns around and goes, excuse me? <laughs> They're just words, man. They're just words until you do something about it. What are you going to do about it? Angel looked up at the statue of the mother of God and realized who came to visit him that day in the hospital room. And he looked back at the kid and said, a lot. He then went out and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the leader of the Latin kings. He said, tomorrow you and your boys are coming to church with me. Don't go for your gun. I'll put my left foot across the left side of your face before you reach it. Kid reached for his gun. Next thing he knew, he was laying on the floor. They came to Mass. He did the same thing with the Ninetas and the other gangs, and there's a parish in Brooklyn where you check your colors and your, door, your weapons at the door before you go to church, <laughs> because Crazy Angel visited that gang. <laughs> he did something about it, and he brought them to faith. I tell you that story because we hear saying a lot of things tonight, but the question is, what are you going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? This is our day. This is our time. This is our fight. Viva Cristo Rey. May God bless you and Mary keep you.